Hi, this is Pastor Steve Webb of the Church of the Nazarene. You know, they say there are two things that are certain in this life, death and taxes. Well, today I want to say a few words about taxes. Fun, right? Well, first, let me begin by encouraging you that if you're not already involved in a church, please take a moment and look for one nearby. It's pretty easy to do nowadays. Just Google something like churches near me or churches in Yucca Valley or in 29, wherever you live. Or maybe you know somebody you like that goes to church. Maybe you would like theirs. You can check out most churches on their respective web pages or social media pages. For example, if you Google churches near me, you can just click on links that come up and poke around a little bit. Now, my wife and I moved to Chicago in 1980 so that I could go to grad school and earn a Ph.D., in those days, the Cold War had not quite ended. President Reagan was breaking the Russian bank by building a 600-ship navy. And that worked pretty well, too, as it turns out, because America could outspend the weak Soviet economy. Of course, that meant American citizens had to foot the bill, right? But it was cheaper than World War. Anyway, in those days, my wife and I attended an inner-city church with a pastor who was very involved in cross-cultural ministry and also compassionate ministries. He and I got along really well. Once when we were talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and yes, we remember it, the conversation drifted to the possibility of nuclear war. I noted that Chicago was certainly a target and wondered what would be the best thing to do if the bombs fell. I commented that since the city stretches all along Lake Michigan, probably the best bet was to make your way to the lake and swim or wade north or south along the shore, getting away from the mushroom cloud as fast as you could. Hopefully the water would protect from fire and wash away the radioactive ash. My pastor responded without hesitation. Not me, he said. I will be running toward the smoke. I asked why, and he responded, Hey, somebody's got to help those people. Now, in telling that story, I think of first responders at 9-11. Heroes run toward the danger, right? But I have to say that he made me think for the very first time that there might be a time when a Christian was put in harm's way for just such a time as this. Indeed, there are times that our own best interest is outweighed by the needs of others. Christian duty often demands that we put others first. Today's Bible passage depends on that idea. In Matthew's Gospel account of the ministry of Jesus, Jesus quickly falls out of favor with the religious leaders of the day. We'll pick up the story in Matthew 22:15. The Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Now tell us, what do you think about this? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said. Why are you trying to trap me? Now, the historical record shows that the Romans actually did collect a lot of taxes. We know that they had customs taxes, import and export taxes, toll bridges, crop taxes, sales tax, property taxes, and there were special taxes that were levied when there was a war or something like a big building project to finance. Basically, if commerce or productivity or income were involved, Taxes were, too. The giant war machine of the empire, its roads and food distribution, building all those beautiful buildings, some of which still stand today, all required a huge cash flow to maintain. Anyway, let's go back to the story in Matthew. You hypocrites, he said. Why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the tax. And when they handed him a Roman coin, he asked, Whose picture and title are stamped on this coin? Caesar's, they replied. Well then, Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. His reply amazed them, and they went away. On their arrival in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and asked him, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? 
Yes, he does, Peter replied. Then he went into the house. But before he had a chance to speak, Jesus asked him, What do you think, Peter? Do kings tax their own people or the people they have conquered? You see, in the first part of this passage, the religious leaders tried to trick Jesus into making seditious statements about the Roman Empire by asking him about the tax policies. Then they could get him in trouble with the Romans, but it didn't work. So then they tried to get him in trouble over religious stuff. You see, the temple tax was a Jewish tax collected by the Jewish power structure. It was required of Jewish males over 20 years of age, and the money was used for the upkeep and maintenance of the temple. The temple tax was paid annually. The amount was about a half shekel, roughly equal to two days' wages. The temple tax was collected during one of the Jewish festivals, Passover, Pentecost, or Tabernacles. So this passage addresses both national taxes and local taxes by the government and also taxes by the church. So back to the story. Jesus was asking Peter if the king made his own kids pay the taxes that he levied. They tax the people they have conquered, Peter replied. Well then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. Now, let me explain that Jesus' words here do need some comment. He is pointing out that those in God's kingdom are not conquered, they are free, so the temple tax should not apply to them. The temple rulers had become earthly kings, so to speak, and they ruled Judea like they were conquerors, but Jesus doesn't recognize their authority over him. He seems to have a bigger picture in mind. Let's read on. Well, then, Jesus said, the citizens are free. However, we don't want to offend everyone. So go down to the lake and throw in a line. Open the mouth of the first fish that you catch, and you will find a large silver coin. Take it and pay the tax for both of us. You see, Jesus used the question about the temple tax to teach a lesson. The Bible says that Christians are free, spiritually free, but they must sometimes relinquish their rights in order to uphold their witness, to not offend anyone, and to not cause others to stumble. Sometimes it is our turn to be the hands and feet of Christ. True freedom is serving others, not ourselves. Listen to this verse from the book of Galatians. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. One of the ways that we serve is by being good citizens. Free citizens, Jesus called us. We participate in society. We give more than we take. We ask not what our country can do for us. Rather, what can I do for my country? We run toward the smoke because somebody has to help those people, right? We pay our taxes because somebody has to pay for the highway we all drive on, for the military presence that preserves our freedom, for social security, to pay for our children's schools. You get the picture. People know we are Christians by our love, right? So listen to this passage from Romans 13. Everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God, and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right, but in those who are doing wrong. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Then do what is right, and they will honor you. Now, all of that was in the Bible. I'm still reading from the words in Romans. Let's continue there. The authorities are God's servants, sent for your good. But if you are doing wrong, of course you should be afraid, for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants, sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. Yes, I'm still reading from the Bible. Let's keep going. Pay your taxes, too, for those same reasons. Government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. And give to everyone what you owe them. 
pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Wow, listen, Christians in America, these scriptures are for you. There are several ideas here that I know cause Americans to chafe because they're individualists, right? Particularly the idea that authorities are God's workers and we are to submit to our leaders. You know, according to the polls, over the last 50 years, at any given time, roughly half of America doesn't respect their president. It's true of both Democrat and Republican presidents. What does that mean for Christians in America then? Understand that when the passage I read was written, the government was not democratic and was controlled by an emperor. I'm sure the people then didn't like their government either. And we are so much freer today. Yet, even so, the emphasis of the passage is on cooperating, following the law, being a good citizen for your own reputation as well as for the good of others. Look, overcoming the government is God's fight. Give unto Caesar in America means obey the law, be a good citizen, vote, be informed, participate, pay your taxes, do what is right. You see, America needs Christians to be the salt of this great land. So follow God in your daily life and just obey the law. The idea that we should submit to government authority chafes at us, especially when government does things that are wrong. But hey, look, we all know that America is not a Christian nation today, if it ever was, and it will certainly not always do the Christian thing. Hey, we actually believe that the government should be separate from religion, right? Yet, we need to remind ourselves the way Daniel reminded King Nebuchadnezzar God controls the course of world events. He removes kings, and he sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. So having heard that, let me remind you, we know it's all going to work out in the end. So if it seems like things are not working out right now, well, it just means we haven't got to the end of it yet. In recent days, many Christians refused to comply with COVID-19 restrictions. Somehow, the idea of protecting others from the germs you might be spreading became a political issue that some Christians thought was more important than their responsibility to others. They said the government had no right to regulate that. But in light of these verses, what do you think Jesus would say to us today about that? Look, it's not the idea of this passage that your government is godly or that you should be one party or the other. The idea is that if you are godly, then you will not rebel against the law of the land. This is because your primary mission is not fighting for your best political advantage. It is serving those around you. In America, we live in a democratic system, so we get to advocate for ourselves and others. It's part of the system. It's a wonderful thing. We live our daily lives as godly as we can, helping where we can. We will run toward the mushroom cloud in the event that sacrificial help is needed. And meanwhile, we comply with the law, pay our taxes, and vote when we have the chance. We pray every day that God will bring the change that is needed, and we trust him to do it while we carry on in the world the way that it is. One last observation. In the passage we read at the beginning of this message, where Jesus was challenged by the religious leaders about paying taxes, he got the money to pay his temple tax by looking in the mouth of a fish. It's so ludicrous, so fantastic. It must be an object lesson. Look, he demonstrates that in the chorus of our daily provisions, even the very food we eat, God will supply our needs. He will work it out. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself each day, has enough trouble of its own.
Look, politics in America have become divisive and rude. All too often, it matters not whether a proposal is a good idea or not. If someone is on, quote, the other side, then it's easier to throw shade on him than to work with him on what are good ideas and bad ideas. Everything seems to have so much spin. How do you know who to trust? It leaves us with a lot of anxiety and fear. But think about that verse I just read from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says not to worry because God is in control and things will work out according to his big picture. Jesus simply says that if you seek God and righteousness, then God will take care of the things that you need as well. Just obey the law and pay your taxes and get on with your life. Your real mission is taking care of those you know. And you know what? That will give meaning and purpose to your life that the government can't provide you and the government can't take away. All right, well, thanks for listening, and God bless.